afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. Um, this is the International Space Science Institute's Game Changers seminar series, uh, where we look at missions that change the game in the space sciences. And I'm Tilman Spohn, and I am your host here at the EC in Bern. Um, there's hardly been any other mission or mission program that has more fundamentally changed our way of understanding space than Apollo, Apollo Lunar Exploration Program. We had the first landing and the only landing today, human landing today, an extraterrestrial body, the first in situ study by trained geologists, first sample return, very important these days, the first extraterrestrial seismic experiment. Uh, you know, we now have uh, insight, but uh, you know, I'm not never spiking later, but uh, you know, we're all in the heritage of, of Apollo, the first extraterrestrial heat flow measurement, which you tried to do at inside and unfortunately failed. Uh, and with particular reverence to the University of Bern and actually to ISI, the first in situ collection of solar wind particles. Uh, Johannes Geis, who is the founding father of the uh, Institute, ISI, um, had conceived of and built a simple but effective sensor to collect solar wind particles. And that was actually the first scientific instrument installed on an extraterrestrial surface by human beings soon after the landing of Apollo 11. Uh, they put it out after the, 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 the garbage bin, but it was the first instrument you know, on, on the surface. Uh, Jim, Jim Head, you know, who's our speaker today, is actually an eyewitness. He was in, involved in the, in the uh, Luna program, the Apollo program. He had analyzed potential landing sites and studied return samples and had provided training for the Apollo astronauts. Uh, he's a geologist by training, and he looks at uh, uh, processes that form and modify surfaces, crusts, and this year of planet. And he's uh, one of the big names in planetary geology. Uh, he received uh, you know many uh, medals and honors, uh, including, and that was news to him actually when I when I wrote that in my my letter to him that the head mountains in Antarctica bear his name since 2007. So it took until 2021 before Jim, you know, actually got word that he has an mountain range in Antarctica being named after him. Uh, he's been, or he is the co-I uh, of uh, many missions uh, following Apollo. Uh, and he is, um, you know, one of the best speakers that he could actually have, you know, for presenting us with the Apollo Luna program. Jim, the floor is yours without further ado. Okay, thank you very much, Tillman. It's a, just a great pleasure to be associated with EC again. I've been there a number of times, and it's always been a pleasure, uh, starting with when Johannes Geis and, uh, was there, and also, uh, of course, uh, Roger Bonnet and others. Uh, it's just really great. So um, I, I want to try to share with you today some of the really uh, results of the Apollo uh, Lunar Exploration Program. And I want to make four points, basically. The first one is the value of human and robotic partnerships, working together human and robotics to explore planetary surfaces. The second one is that if you do that, you need to work with engineers. Science and engineering synergism that results from that is really the key to success and enables the science that we were able to do. Thirdly, Apollo 15 to 17, you'll see the progression here. Apollo 15 to 17 were scientific expeditions to the moon. In the United States, we think of Lewis and Clark, exploring, literally it was a scientific expedition of the moon for each of these, and I'll show you why that's the case. And they built the progressive capabilities uh, to be able to do that. And then finally, Apollo, really the legacy of Apollo and the game-changing aspects of Apollo are not something to look back on. There's something to look forward on because this is the foundation uh, that we build on to really understand the terrestrial planets and indeed exoplanets, et cetera. So uh, those are the basic messages I'd like to leave uh, with you by the end of the talk. And <clears throat> again, we're in the middle of the 50th anniversary, uh, Apollo 14, between Apollo 14 and Apollo 15. And uh, indeed, uh, we're now planning uh, essentially the uh, Artemis program uh, where we're going forward to the moon and on to Mars together. So this is really important. And we'll see how some of these things will factor into the Artemis program as well. Uh, very exciting times. Uh, I spent, uh, I think it was Monday, over an hour with the flight operations director at Johnson Space Center, talking to them about operations on the moon with Artemis. Uh, these lessons are really important for the future. And it's great that we're working shoulder to shoulder with the engineers as we move on uh, uh, forward to the moon and then on to Mars. 
<clears throat> so it's really helpful to go back to set the stage for why this is such a game changer to figure out what we knew before 1959, pre-1959. <laughs> you know, it's most of you, of course, will not have a clue as what, but, but I remember that, okay. Um, <clears throat> what do we know and what did we not know? Well, we didn't know the origin of the moon. We didn't know the age of the moon. We didn't know the age of the surfaces, the nature of the surfaces. Some people like Tommy Gold felt that when we landed in these Moria, they were filled with dust and the astronauts would sink out of sight. Um, we didn't know uh, indeed the origin of craters. Literally, there was two camps. There were two camps. One thought they were of impact origin and the other thought they were of volcanic origin. And there was no middle ground. It reminds me of politics in the US today. You know, you're either one or the other. It's not, there's no discussion to be had, okay? Um, but most importantly, actually, to get perspective on this, we didn't know what the other half of the moon looked like for crying out loud. So we didn't know what the far side looked like. This was pre-Luna uh, uh, 3 and the Soviet mission that gave us the first fuzzy clues of the far side. So, you know, it, okay, in all honesty, it's not hard to have a game changer here because we didn't know anything, okay? But indeed, it's a lot more than that. So um, basically, let's go back to the early 60s. The Soviet Union uh, was in fact launching tons of missions. They were really beautifully engineered and robotic missions, lunar landers, lunar cod, sample return missions, lunar orbiters. And they actually had Zond human rated missions which went into orbit around Mars or did uh, orbits um, returning to the earth, et cetera, to set up. They were actually literally going to the moon. Uh, buy me a beer sometime and I'll tell you all about, uh, about the N1 and all these other uh, uh, basic programmatic aspects uh, that, that unfortunately resulted in failure, but beautiful robotic engineering. <clears throat> this was a precursor again in 1961, this US Soviet essentially uh, power struggle, basically uh, global power struggle um, for President Kennedy's speech in 1961, who set the amazing goal. Uh, what do you think? Let's send humans to the moon and return them safely by the end of the decade. Well, you know, I encourage you to read Chris Kraft's book called Flight, and you'll know from this that we didn't know anything. Okay, so let's see, we're gonna put people in space. We need a global communication system. Oh, uh, actually we don't have one. Hmm, we're gonna have to make one. Okay, all of these things had to be done before we could even consider how to do it, let alone uh, what to do uh, in the process. I was in grad school in the late uh, mid 1960s to late 1960s. I was finishing my thesis, uh, PhD thesis on shallow marine carbonate environments in the early Devonian of the Appalachians, nothing to do with the moon or any other planet except the earth. And I was looking for a job and I turned to the college placement annual, which is a book of jobs. I went to the back, looked up a uh, geologist and 16 to 21, there were like a dozen or so um, ads, uh, but I never turned to those. I saw at page 62, I said, well, what's that outlier? I turned to page 62 and it had this picture of the moon and it just had these words. Our job is to think our way to the moon and back with a phone number in the lower right-hand corner. I mean, how could you not call that number? So I call that number uh, and indeed a few few little things in between, but I basically got the job. It was NASA headquarters. And from uh, essentially uh, 1968 to 1974, three or four, I worked in the Apollo Lunar Exploration Program. I mean, we had incredible capabilities here. This incredible Saturn V launch vehicle, the command and service modules, the astronauts were in here. This alt but eventually on the J missions, 15, 16, and 17 was hollowed out with a huge number of uh, orbital instruments here. Landers down to the surface that took the astronauts there and lots of equipment, ascent vehicle to bring them back with the samples and so on. And so what did I do during this period of time? I worked at NASA headquarters. I was a systems engineer. I'd never had a course in engineering. <laughs> I didn't even know what a systems engineering engineer was. It turned out that a systems engineer was someone who thought their way to the moon and back. And geologists, it turns out, are pretty good at that because for a variety of reasons. Um, so I worked in 1968 to 73 in exploration strategy. What questions do we want to address about the moon? Landing site selection. Well, where do we go to get those answered, the questions answered? And then once we get a landing site, what do we do when we get there? Okay, traverse planning. And then of course, how do we implement the science goals and objectives? We need to work closely with the uh, engineers. And this is where the science and engineering synergism comes in. You will see uh, in a few minutes here that this was a beautiful example of how working shoulder to shoulder with the engineers, we were indeed able to uh, beautifully increase the capability at each time uh, as they develop more confidence, we had more questions and so on. And then of course, astronaut training, spent a huge amount of time 
uh, with a group uh, who took the astronauts uh, around the planet, basically trained them uh, both in class and uh, field trips, simulations, et cetera. And then we did tons of simulations. We practiced a lot. Uh, we were there in Houston in the actual mission operations in the science room. And um, you know, basically we'd go to the Cape to brief the astronauts just before they left for the moon. Once we watched the liftoff, we'd head to Houston immediately, get in the uh, mission operations control room, building 31, be there. And then when they came back um, and successfully splashed down and returned to Houston, we would do post-mission debriefing and analysis. And then of course, this got factored into feed forward, which is replanning of the subsequent missions based on what you learn, both from a science and an engineering capability. So here's something that I really want to emphasize. A lot of people think, well, Apollo, it's all about Apollo 11. We got, we got a few rocks, et cetera, that was it. <laughs> that was not it, okay? And the goal was, yes, indeed, to send a human to the moon, return him safely by the end of the decade, but there was incredible amounts, a uh, huge range of science at all levels during Apollo, and I want to try to convince you of that uh, because it's important for the future. So this was the basic, understand the nature, internal structure, and history of the moon and its environment, and we had a four-pronged approach. Surface science station, these were geophysical and other types of instruments, the ALSEP. Surface exploration, this wasn't just the astronauts moving around on the surface. It indeed was deployment of gravimeters, magnetometers, active seismic, surface electrical properties instruments, and even astronomical instruments. Orbital exploration, astronauts stayed in orbit and continued in orbit once they left the surface. And there were lots of experiments on the uh, orbiting spacecraft. And then the moon was used as a platform. This is critically important. It's a great platform. It's outside the Earth's atmosphere. Lyman Alpha telescopes, gravity waves, solar wind experiments, et cetera. Huge range of science at all levels during Apollo. It's really important to remember that. Not only that, <clears throat> we didn't know anything about the moon. We didn't know, again, whether we were going to sink in. You know, is that an astronaut footprint? That's good news. It means they don't sink down to the surface, uh, subsurface, and get buried with dust. So 21 robotic precursor missions prior to the time that Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. In eight years, 21 robotic precursor missions, Ranger, Surveyor, Lunar Orbiter, all these things did specific things to teach us about the moon so we could plan the human exploration. We work with all these data throughout uh, the preparations. And I'm gonna come back to this uh, each with each of the missions, which I will describe very briefly here. These are the Apollo launch dates with the astronaut uh, missions, okay? So we have Apollo 7 through 10. These were precursor missions, just like anything. You don't just go to the moon. You have to figure out how to use the command module in Earth orbit. You have to figure out how to leave, leave Earth's gravity well. You have to test out the rendezvous and docking and extraction of the lunar module from the command module and the Saturn IV B. And then you have to practice in lunar orbit. This was all done prior to the first landing on Apollo 11 uh, in 1969. But each of these missions that subsequently went by, okay, increased the capability of Apollo. I'm going to come back to this one at a time or several at a time here with each mission to show you how working shoulder to shoulder with the engineers, we were really able to enhance the scientific exploration return. So of course, the first thing we wanted to do was to land safely. Oh, that's good. Because as Matt Gollenbeck of JPL always says, if you don't land safely, you don't have a mission, you don't have a mission, you don't have a program. And of course, they're humans, so we're really concerned about their safety, obviously. These are really great, all of them highly motivated uh, 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 individuals and very interested in what they were doing, et cetera, et cetera. So Apollo 11 um, was in fact focused on the near side of the moon in the Maria, one of the smooth places in the Maria here, in the Eastern Maria and Maria Tranquilla Tatis, July 16th, 1969, uh, Apollo 11 was launched and it indeed landed safely. Um, and indeed, you can see the surface experiments package here, laser ranging retroreflector, seismometer, a whole series of instruments here that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set up. They did traverses on the surface. Okay, here's the lunar module. I want to point out the scale here. We're going to look at the scale for each of these. 50 meters. That's actually pretty good for first. <laughs> you can see that they traversed around here uh, for several hundred meters, setting up instruments, doing geological analyses, picking up samples in context in geological context uh, and indeed uh, accomplishing a lot of science. Now here you can see some views of the surface. Uh, this is uh, the astronauts, Neil Armstrong here, uh, setting up the flag, Buzz uh, and Neil uh, on a geological field trip we had out to Meteor Crater, one of many. Um, and again, a whole host of things here. And I wanna point out here, 
um, the uh, solar wind experiment, which was Johannes Geist's experiment here. Now, um, here it is being unfurled, as uh, Tillman mentioned, the, one of the first, the first instrument that was set up on another planetary body. And most people think, oh yeah, we planted the American flag. But everybody in Switzerland knows that actually this thing was the first flag on the moon. <laughs> it was the Swiss flag, okay. Uh, didn't, have the, didn't have the cross on it, but everybody knew what it was. So when that was unfurled, uh, I think uh, we all knew what was going on. Switzerland was first to the moon. So Apollo 11 uh, was on the surface uh, for only one EVA activity, two hours and a half. And the total traverse was only a few hundred meters, which is not bad for a first exploration of the moon. But they returned almost 21 and a half kilograms uh, of, of rocks. And these rocks and soils were amazing, okay? Uh, basically, from these soils, John Wood, looking at these bright fragments here, was able to propose the concept of a lunar magma ocean, you know, even from the Apollo 11 soil. Everybody was going for the rocks. John said, I want to see what was thrown in from outside. And he actually came up with the model after Apollo 11, uh, just, you know, at the beginning of the lunar magma ocean. We'll come back to that. Well, we wanted to increase the capabilities. So we worked very closely with the engineers to increase the stay time on the lunar surface. Let's stay longer. Let's increase the number of, of times we can go out on the surface to two. And let's demonstrate pinpoint landing. When Neil Armstrong um, pitched over, <clears throat> the way the lunar module works, you fly looking up at space and then you pitch over as you're landing. And when he did that, he recognized there were a bunch of boulders on the surface. It was not a good place to land. So he flew it down range. Uh, we actually didn't know where they were on the moon exactly, uh, even during the Apollo 11 operations. So uh, we wanted to pinpoint land so that we could actually go to rougher places and land among and in the roughness in a smooth place. So indeed, um, Apollo 12 was uh, targeted just a few months later, four months later after Apollo 11, targeted to this area here in the Western Moria, in fact, to the Surveyor 3 spacecraft location. This was an important scientific location but one of the heads of, um, the, the, actually Bob Gilruth, the head of the uh, Johnson Space Center, uh, in fact, was um, instrumental in saying, let's target for the Surveyor 3 spacecraft so we engineers can have a goal. And incredible. So they landed safely uh, in Procolarum, Okeanos Procolarum. Uh, this is Albine uh, getting out of the lunar module. And you can see here, there's the lunar module in the background. There's Surveyor 3. That was a pinpoint landing. You don't want to get too much closer to it, okay? and they were able to go over and inspect it. Uh, so this established pinpoint landing, and they were able to do two EVAs. Here's the location here, uh, an EVA out to a whole series of craters here, and then we're able to set up the LSEP, et cetera, and also uh, get to different scales of craters here, which in fact excavated material from different depths. And they did a superb job. One of the things they commented on though was carrying things over this distance uh, was, you know, was a little problematic, that is to say, it would help to have a little bit of a uh, mobility uh, transporter to, um, to carry the samples and also all the equipment, et cetera. So they were on the surface for two EVAs, uh, almost eight hours of EVA activity with a total traverse of now three kilometers. And again, almost 34 and a half kilograms of rocks and soils. Among those was a kind of a creek basalt. For those of you in, who work on these kinds of things, you'll understand, you'll know that that's a really unusual um, uh, rock type and was beginning to be understood as a, a fundamental aspect of the thermal evolution and the petrogenetic evolution of the moon, uh, possible ejecta from Copernicus, et cetera, and really, really important results. Um, but they also said, again, when we debriefed, they said, hey, let's, can we get some equipment uh, to transport tools and samples, okay? So we worked on that with the engineers and already started thinking about that. And Apollo 14, which uh, launched nine months later after the uh, uh, Apollo 13 uh, 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 accident, if you will, um, nine months after Apollo 13, launched to the Fra Mauro Formation, which was the ejecta deposit of the Embrian Basin. So the big impact here through eject out, we wanted to know what that looked like, date the Embrian event, and understand how eject is emplaced on the surface of the moon. So that was the goal for both 13 as well as 14. It was a very rough terrain. It's radially textured ejecta. And indeed, having the Apollo 12 pinpoint landing permitted us to go to, in fact, this area. And you can see the rough topography here. Uh, basically, look at the hills here. And they landed in between these radial hills. And they did a great job. Uh, Al Shepard and Ed Mitchell went down to the surface. And Stu Roos has stayed in orbit. Here's Al looking at a geological map traversing 
uh, into the geological terrain uh, uh, to sample the Pramara formation. They had two EVAs, um, you know, almost nine and a half hours on the surface, three to four kilometers, and they had almost 43 kilograms of rocks and soils. And again, you can see these tracks here. These are the tracks of the mobile equipment transporter. It, it's the MET. You know, it's a NASA thing. It's got to have an acronym. It was the MET. Here it is here. It's like a little wheelbarrow with all the stuff on it. You put your rocks in here, collect all this, et cetera. There's Al right there um, putting together a, a core to begin taking a core, such as you see here. And uh, indeed, this really helped. So having this capability, working closely with the engineers, enabled even more uh, rocks and soils and more traverse distance uh, aided by this mobile equipment transport. The rocks from Apollo 14 were amazing. So the, not only the ejecta deposit from the Framar formation, dating of the Embryum event, understanding the relationships of, of how rocks can be broken up, and of course, a, a cornucopia of samples in the Embryum ejecta uh, from the Embryum impact event. Among these is a felsite clast. Now, recently people have uh, argued that in fact, this felsite clast may actually have been blown off Earth early in its history, and indeed landed on the moon and got incorporated in this ejecta. Now, of course, that's under debate right now, but the point is that that is indeed a harbinger of things to come. We actually will have a witness plate of events on the Earth on the moon at this time period when there's virtually no record of uh, the geology of, of the Earth at that time. So again, a promising aspect. Here you can see the traverses that the astronauts undertook uh, and a lot of the samples uh, that they uh, also took. So of course we wanted, we're scientists, we wanted more, okay? So we work with the engineers to do several things, okay? How can we indeed increase the number of EVA periods to three, maybe even four, uh, provide mobility to reach distant targets? And most importantly was because of the way you go into orbit around the moon and the way you like to land and then ascend and rendezvous with the lunar module, the command module and lunar module, it's best to be in a, a, a equatorial orbit. It's simplest. We wanted to do a plane change so that in fact, we could go to higher latitudes. And so what that meant was that the astronauts not only had to do a plane change, but then as their orbit precessed, they had to do some complex maneuvers to get back to the lunar module. So this not only required engineering aspects to get these periods to EVA three and also to reach distant targets, but in fact required a lot of engineering and planning uh, and astronaut cooperation uh, to uh, be able to uh, do a plane change. So six months after Apollo 14, Apollo 15 uh, on July 26, 1971 launched to the edge of the Embryon Basin. This is, we wanted now having samples from the Fra Formation, we wanted to get deeper ejecta from the deeper part of the lunar crust right on the rim and understand what the basin formation mechanisms and what the Mare looked like there. Was the Mare generated by the impact? or was it later? Uh, and there's a variety of goals and objectives here for the Apollo 15 mission. <clears throat> so this did require this plane change. Here are the equatorial regions here, okay? And we wanted to get out of that so we could get to higher latitudes like the Apollo 15 <coughs> Hadley Apennine site, for example, at about 26 north. So this was required and the engineers figured out a way to do this. The astronauts practiced it and they did a great job. The, the other thing it required was astronaut cooperation because it required an abnormally steep lunar module descent profile. So what does that mean? Well, if you take a look at the Apollo 15 site here, okay, you'll see it's nestled in these mountains. The light is coming from this direction. That's a mountain, okay? That's a depression, a crater. And basically uh, you had to land, you had to fly over a 14,000 foot high peak and land prior to the time you cross a 900 meet meter uh, depth, um, and essentially trough, okay, or a sinuous rill, like a dried up river valley. So this required basically to go down, not descending down like you would do normally, but you had to do a steep descent down so you could, in fact, get over the mountain, but stop short of the sinuous rill. Dave Scott, the commander said, okay, look, we'll go into the simulators and practice this. I think we can do that. So they simulated it a while. They worked with operations, set up a set of procedures, and they said, yeah, we can do that. So, the, so you'll see here that they did it. There's the mountain in the background. There's the lunar module on the surface. There's Jim Irwin and Dave Scott. <clears throat> and you can see that not only did they successfully land here, 
but they in fact <laughs> carried with them, folded up in this little compartment here, a rover. And this rover enabled them to increase their capabilities on the surface. Here's Dave Scott patiently awaiting Jim Irwin to get on, take the picture and let's get going here. Uh, he's got the geological maps here uh, and all the cameras, et cetera, ready. Um, and they were ready for exploration. And this was indeed a scientific expedition. One stand-up EVA where they depressurized the lunar module, got up, opened the hatch, looked out the top and did the lay of the land. Believe it or not, we landed in 20 meter resolution data. So the SIBA was important to figure out if there were any unusual things going on from a traffic ability and other standpoint. They had three EVAs, seven kilometers radius from the lunar module here down to the uh, Apennine front, et cetera. A total traverse of over 30 kilometers and 77 kilograms of rocks and soils. This was an incredible scientific expedition, incredible scientific expedition. And indeed, you can see from these images here, uh, I'll just point out a couple of things. The Genesis rock that Dave recognized from, from plagioclase twinning, Dave and Jim recognized this they saw the twinning in the sunlight, recognized it as plagioclase, and they said, that's coarse, coarsely crystalline. They figured all that out before they even got there. Dave said, Houston, I think we found what we came for. And indeed it was. There it is right there in the lab. There it is unpacking with Dave and, and Jim. Um, they also discovered a lot of things. Discovery was a critical aspect. You know, you hear, oh, the astronauts were all scripted. Yes, we had a plan. No idiot would go to the moon <clears throat> or any place in the field geologically without a plan. Okay, trust me. Five seasons in Antarctica, you gotta have a plan. Okay, you, you, you need a plan. Okay, so indeed, but was it scripted? No, it was discovery. And here's a good example. Dave Scott, <clears throat> Dave Scott discovered this green pyroclastic glass. You should go to the uh, transcripts and the recordings of this, <clears throat> excuse me, because in fact, what this shows is the excitement, excitement in their voices as they make these discoveries. 40 years later in 2011 or so, uh, water was discovered in these glass beads by Alberta Saul in our lab uh, at Brown. And it like amazing, this revolutionized our thinking. Dave Scott discovered that. And I have a picture, I couldn't find it here of him sitting with a, an undergraduate who's showing him after all these years having collected it earlier, uh, the green glass that Alberta had just found the water in. But it was not just that. We understood the origin of the Hadley Rill from these data, we looked at the layering in the Hadley Reel, beautiful samples of this, et cetera. Uh, and indeed on the way back from EVA2, Dave Scott uh, was indeed able to <coughs> sample this um, vesicular basalt, which gave us a lot of really interesting ideas about degassing a magma on the moon. We talked about this prior to the mission saying, hey, look, you know, we were really trying to understand volatiles and lunar magmas. If you see anything vesicular like this, you know, sample it. Dave's on the way back. Houston's telling him to get back to the lunar module. Uh, you're running out of oxygen, get back to the lunar module. Dave sees this sample sitting off to the side, stops the rover and says, Houston, I got a problem with my seat belt. I need to stop and fix it. Hey, oh yeah, so we don't want you falling off the rover. Uh, he gets off, goes over, documents it, picks it up, samples it, gets back on the rover. Houston, uh, my seat belt's good. Okay, good to go, get back to the lunar module. We call that an unauthorized stop. Uh, Dave calls it the commander's prerogative. Uh, and we call the rock the seat belt basalt. That gives you an idea of the kind of training and, and dedication of these. I have to say one thing that when Dave came back from the moon, he said, you know, um, he told me that I had so much fun doing the geology that I didn't even know I had my spacesuit on. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I'd be aware of that spacesuit as I looked up at the earth a couple hundred thousand kilometers away. But Dave was totally, he called it uh, in, the, in the groove, in the groove, as he said. So nine months later, Apollo 16 launched to um, indeed uh, the, the Cayley formation, the Descartes region of the moon. The goal here was to study this dark area here. It was brighter than the Maria, but darker than uh, a lot of the surrounding highlands. It was thought because it was smooth to be volcanic plains. Okay, so what was the volcanism going on here? Um, and indeed, uh, how did it get in place? What was its mineralogy and petrology? And what did that mean for the thermal and petrogenetic evolution of the moon. That was the, one of the main objectives of the Apollo 16 mission. So John Young and Charlie Duke descended down to the surface where Ken Mattingly stayed in orbit. <clears throat> and indeed, when they got to the surface, they discovered that it wasn't highland volcanics, but basin and crater impact ejecta. And they, because of their geological training, literally they, and being smart people, okay, they immediately recognized this. Um, 
and uh, uh, it, it was just amazing. So um, they, in fact, recognized this, altered their sampling plan and their uh, strategy, et cetera, and did a beautiful job of sampling uh, the breaches and modifications and the ejecta that they found here. Uh, they had three EVAs, they traversed 27 kilometers and they picked up almost 100, not picked up, they documented in samples almost 100 kilograms of rocks and soils. Re really fantastic mission and it just changed our thinking about the moon as a whole. Of course, then we wanted to send a geologist to the moon as a member of the surface crew. Uh, it was really important uh, in a way to, um, uh, you know, the, the astronauts, all the Apollo astronauts were superb. You know, as a teacher, I, I have to tell you that I couldn't ask for more uh, dedicated, highly motivated students. Trust me on this. No problem doing the homework. No problem doing, you know, working overtime. Not a problem, you know. Uh, you know, we're going to the moon next Tuesday. Let's get this right here. And uh, they were great. They were great. Having Jack Schmidt, the geologist on Apollo 17, was a beautiful compliment uh, to the Apollo program and the scientific expedition of the J missions. So we wanted to go to a specific area here. We knew the ages of the Embryon Basin. We wanted to look at the Serenitanus Basin, which clearly predated this because the ejector from Embryon came on top of it. And we wanted to go to massifs in the southeast part of Serenitanus. There were also these dark mantling deposits here. They mantle everything. And we thought this could be volcanism that literally could be, you know, possibly as young as today. Was the moon still volcanically active? Uh, a very major question. These, these deposits blanketed everything. And so that was another major goal of this mission. So indeed, December, eight months after Apollo 16, Apollo 17 uh, sent to the moon, and Gene Cernan and Jack Schmidt, Schmidt went down to the surface and explored it. And Ron Evans stayed in orbit <coughs> to uh, do a lot of experiments there. And here you can see the kinds of things, beautiful number, uh, incredible number of scientific experiments set up, but also Jack was able to, and Gene with the rover, able to go over and look at these incredibly large uh, boulders that had rolled downhill. And indeed, look at the stratigraphy of the boulder inside. This was really a talent that his geological background helped in the sampling. Not only that, and again, go back to the uh, voice recordings of the missions. They're superb, and you will hear the excitement. There's orange soil. It's orange. I mean, and you know, this was the pyroclastic deposits, the excitement in their voices, and they did a superb job of sampling this. We thought at the time in mission control that it was indeed likely to be um, volcanic in nature. And because it was orange, we thought it was like a, a, a alteration deposit. Um, and we thought it was very young too. <laughs> Interestingly, um, when we got it back in the lab, it was dated at 3.7 billion years old, not today. And we understood now why this stuff looked like it was uh, essentially a, a, a young mantling deposit because the pyroclastic deposits themselves actually ate craters. In other words, if you impact into a dark deposit, you don't see the bright ejecta you see typically, and you underestimate the number of craters. This was a major finding among many on Apollo 17. And they did three EVAs, they traversed 35 kilometers and returned 111 kilograms of rocks and soils. So this is amazing. So in my job, of course, uh, was still not over here because even though the Apollo program was coming to an end, uh, we had do plans to send roving vehicles to the next landing sites. Uh, I worked on Apollo 18, 19, 20, and 21, which none of you have ever heard of, but these were in fact going to have robotic rovers on them. The, the human rover would be converted to robotic and control from the earth. It would have a panel, a group of uh, a, a caboose, if you will, on the back, and these would be sent off to tra traverse hundreds of kilometers to the next landing site to interpolate and extrapolate the information between landing sites. So again, science and engineering synergism was working beautifully. So I wanna emphasize again, none of this increase in capability would be possible without the science and engineering synergism, working shoulder to shoulder with engineers, learning their language, understanding how uh, you can help them and they can help you, providing you know, requirements and demands that are, are, are exciting, not necessarily just, I need this, I want that. So let me say that science and engineering synergism is a key uh, to success in the future. And you can see here from these maps here, this is the, all the Apollo Travers uh, put to a common point here and a scale here. Each of these is one kilometer radius out to about 11 kilometers here. And <clears throat> what you can see here is the absolute amazing increase in capabilities 
with time. Uh, and indeed, you can see here in terms of traverse distance, uh, less than five kilometers for the early Apollo missions out to 35 kilometers by the time Apollo 17 flew. And again, return sample mass, uh, less than about 45 kilograms for the early missions, and indeed up to over 100 kilograms for Apollo 17. And of course, these samples are what revolutionized our thinking as well as the geophysics and other observations. So what is the legacy of Apollo? What were the game changers? I wanna to try to go through this and show you a number of these. Um, <clears throat> they, they're just in incredible. I mean, of course, pre-1959, we didn't know anything. So it's easy to have game changers, but let me just walk you through very briefly the major kinds of concepts that were indeed the game changers. So here they are. And the first one is the return rocks and soil samples were taken in geological context. So we got a diversity of samples, as you can see here, uh, that sample all the different geological major units on the moon. Uh, so, and they were collected in context. You know, they're not like meteorites coming in. Oh, this is interesting. I wonder where it came from. We knew where they came from. We knew the landing sites and not only the landing sites, but actually exactly where it was picked up in the context of the landing site. So it wasn't just, oh, it's Apollo uh, uh, 15 Mare. It's Mare that's from a crater that excavated down 30 meters. And so this is the bottom of the lava flow, not the top of the lava flow. This was really important. And not just for the sites. We can now take these different sites and say, hey, the moon permits linkage of return samples and geology. Here's the Oriental Basin, 920 kilometers in diameter. Beautiful fresh basin, almost unmodified. We can say, hey, I wonder how this ring formed here. And we can go, well, we landed at the edge of that on Apollo 15. I wonder what this ring, oh, we landed there on Apollo 17. Oh, Apollo 16 out here on the ejected deposit and Luna 20 and Apollo 14. So, you know, this is the context we can use uh, to put these back into our uh, understanding of the moon. Lunar geophysics, as Tillman pointed out, unbelievable. Seismology, heat flow experiments, magnetism. The seismology was totally amazing. Uh, you know, we learned there were chemical layers. Uh, indeed, nobody knew if the moon was differentiated. There's a crust, a mantle, a core. The crust has different thicknesses, uh, different parts of the moon. Um, in fact, uh, the mechanical layers, there's a thick lithosphere at the present time, uh, like 800 to 900 kilometers thick. That's really thick for a lithosphere in our terrestrial uh, framework. And there were, these chemical layers turned out to be unstable with time, okay? So the crust and the lower crust turned out partly to be negatively buoyant and foundered and probably had a lot to do with providing the uh, essentially feedstock for the Mari basalts and possibly even parts of the core itself. And this all set the stage for the later thermal evolution. So without the geophysics and without the seismology, we would have known none of this. And this did, together with a sample, set the stage for a lunar magma ocean concept. This is a concept that's critically important for all planetary bodies, because in fact, most of them had late stage accretional heating. Uh, and this leads to not just the moon, not just an north acidic crust, but other varieties of petrogenetic aftermaths, which is what I like to call these. Um, it also set the stage for a really nice paradigm that Ross Taylor set up, which is primary, secondary, and tertiary crust. This is a really good paradigm to link the petrological, geodynamic, thermal, and geological evolution. So primary crust are accreted, are, are formed from uh, uh, essentially alteration by the energy associated with impacts. If there's the right conditions, it can have a plagioclase flotation crust, uh, but it can be other things too. But the concept is there for sure. And then essentially secondary crust is partial melting of the mantle and extrusion of that out to the surface or not as the case may be. And then tertiary crust is a reworking of primary and secondary crust. So we can use this paradigm to think of the similarities and differences between the moon uh, and the other terrestrial planets. This is a major, major change in our thinking and a great paradigm uh, to do. Yes, it's like this. No, it's not. Why? Why not? The other thing is that the moon is stratified into mechanical layers. We talked about this briefly um, uh, because, you know, basically uh, a, a thousand kilometers is the lithosphere in this partially molten region of the, of the lower mantle. Um, these mechanical layers are really important conceptually so the lithosphere is the outer thermal boundary layer, losing heat to the uh, essentially uh, to space. And it thickened and became less heterogeneous with time. Impact basins uh, added a lot of heat, brought up heat from the interior, and made very heterogeneous 
um, lithospheric thickness as a function of time. But as these decreased, lithosphere became uh, essentially thicker and less heterogeneous with time. There's a lot of lessons there for the thermal evolution of the planets. This also enabled us to think about mechanisms of planetary heat loss and thermal evolution. So it's very obvious in this paradigm that the moon in fact loses virtually all of its heat by lithospheric conduction. The lunar maria are inconsequential when it comes to advective heat transfer like we see on Io. Uh, and it's very different than what we see for plate tectonics. So this provided us with a basis on which to think about the other terrestrial planetary bodies with the moon as a globally continuous lithosphere. The other thing we learned was that from the seismology was that in fact, and the samples, that we could take a look at the uh, lower noritic crust and the upper north acidic crust from both seismic characteristics and also excavated material uh, and piece together the compositional stratification of the crust. We also learned that impact cratering from the seismic data, in fact, created a mega regolith uh, because of the impact fracturing, uh, essentially autochthonous and allochthonous breaches, and this mega regolith here hugely important in uh, our thinking about uh, the evolution of planetary bodies. So this was also a critical point too that, 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 uh, that the seismology led to. The heat flow experiment, they showed that there were lateral variations uh, in, in fact, um, the heat flow. Um, and indeed, this led to an understanding of the heterogeneity of potential heat loss on the moon. And indeed, later on in the um, evidence for an enhanced creep layer, and the Procolarum creep terrain and the influence that that might have on the overall evolution of the moon, Brad Jolliffe and others, uh, as well as Mark Wazorek and, and Roger Phillips, et cetera. And could these be, uh, in fact, young basalts here because, in fact, uh, of the Procolarum creep terrain? Uh, the, the recently returned Chang'e 5 samples uh, uh, will, in fact, address this question very, very well. So look forward to more on that. But the fundamental difference in asymmetries in heat flow experiments uh, and the effects of those uh, were born in Apollo. The lunar magnetic field, this is amazing, the discoveries, okay, mm, didn't seem to be a global field, but indeed uh, the Apollo data shows from the samples, from the surface measurements, there were, there were uh, magnetometers that were carried on the surface. Uh, Palmer Dial was a PI on those, lots of really great um, uh, scientists engaged in this early on, and indeed there were orbital measurements during Apollo and of course subsequently as well. The magnetic field intensity varies significantly with time. Uh, what's the origin of the dynamo? Uh, all these questions, what are the origin of these individual anomalies are really, really critical uh, in our thinking. And, and Apollo set the stage for the fundamental understanding of that. And of course, I'm a geologist. So lunar geological processes were also really important and enhanced by Apollo. Impact cratering. I mean, the moon is just a fundamental laboratory. We have all these fresh exposures of simple, complex craters, peak ring basins, multi-ring basins, and we can in fact uh, piece these together and compare them to the terrestrial record, most of which is planed off, so we're looking at the deeper part. So it's an incredibly complementary record. It's enabled us to really develop excellent uh, models for, in fact, um, you know, hydrocode models and other models where we can actually put Apollo data in and essentially constrain these significantly and to understand the crater to basin transition going from impact craters all the way out to things like uh, multi-ring basins. And it really revolutionized our view in lunar volcanism. Apollo revealed a range of features, you know, for me who works in planetary volcanology, it was just amazing, a beautiful cornucopia of features here that we needed to explain. Well, the Apollo images, as well as, of course, the Apollo samples enabled us to figure out what was going on. How does the secondary crust generate it? What are the processes of mantle melting in space and time with the geophysical data? And in sample data, we were able to map out the generation, ascent, and eruption of magma and model it and compare it to the surface features to figure out how pyroclastic volcanism could work in one-sixth gravity in a vacuum. And then map these concepts out of dike emplacement events to the features we see on the lunar surface. And indeed, to work on the full range of volcanism to look at it as a function of time. And again, because we were able to date the surfaces and build up a chronology of absolute ages for relative ages here, we were able to indeed look at the frequency distribution of deposits as a function of time, map this directly back in uh, to the thermal evolution of the moon uh, with the pioneering work of Harry Hesinger and his colleagues um, in, in, uh, in understanding this. And of course, tectonics, I mean, 
you know, a, a basic concept. Sean Solomon published a paper many years ago. Uh, you know, the moon is a one plate planet. I mean, it seems trivial now that you think about it, but at that time it was big news. There's a globally continuous lithosphere. It's a one plate planet. It's not lateral tectonics, folks. It's vertical tectonics that dominate. So we get volcanism that's loading the Mare basins. They, they cause flexure and subsidence and graben. We could actually use these data to map out the thickness of the lithosphere as a function of time and understand vertical tectonics. Uh, and this stood us in good stead when we went to the other planetary bodies. And chronology, I mean, of course, of course, chronology was a critical thing with the return samples. Uh, I, I, I can't tell you the number of people who uh, uh, at, e, at, at uh, Bern and EC and others were fundamental contributions to these things. And I'll just point out a couple of them here. Uh, samples provide the absolute ages for volcanism, plutonism, and, and cratering. Uh, time calibration of stratigraphy and relative ages. Um, you know, we, we have these beautiful uh, uh, evolving understandings of what was going on as a function of time, which, it, of course, the samples calibrate the crater counting chronology. Absolutely fundamental. And then this is what is extrapolated to the other planetary bodies. And if we hadn't had Apollo and returned samples in context, we would not know this. And people absolutely take this for granted now, but it's all rooted in the Apollo program. And what about the origin of the moon? Oh yeah, by the way, <laughs> pretty much uh, we learn, um, not right away, but pretty quickly, that the moon formed from the impact of a Mars-sized object into early Earth. This is pretty amazing when you think about it. And when you do, uh, you understand that something like this, it was thought for years that this would cause severe devolatization. This is why the moon seemed to be so dry. And of course, Alberto Sol, uh, just a decade ago, discovered, in fact, these uh, water and these lunar gases. And this revolutionized our thinking about the uh, first uh, formation of the moon uh, from impact into Earth. It wasn't uh, so devolatilizing, and this caused a lot of revolution in our thinking about where uh, uh, the accreted material from the Earth uh, and the moon impact uh, actually ended up. This is, of course, a context for the early history of the Earth. I mentioned the samples that may be from Earth on the moon, but this whole period here, if you think about the history of the planets as a clock, you know, we, we're lacking the first half of solar system history on the Earth. You see the ocean basins and the continents. Uh, on the moon, we have that. And this is really important. We have fundamental insights into the missing years of Earth history from this uh, uh, Apollo program. We also have it as a template for planetary accretion and bombardment history. I mean, this is, it goes without saying, but we take this for granted. The dating of the samples brought back from Apollo, knowing where they come from, uh, this is what can give us the, the essentially template on which we can build an understanding. So we know, in fact, uh, it, uh, what the flux looks like. We know from how, then we can have put this into uh, uh, models for the evolution and test out models of what's going on in the outer solar system. And also think about how we can, in future exploration, calibrate this. Recognize here that the South Pole Aiken Basin predates much of this apparent cataclysm, or is it part of it? And so this fact factors into future exploration as well. That's why there's so many attempts uh, mission concepts to return samples from the South Pole Aiken Basin. And of course, the moon and from Apollo is a cornerstone for interpreting the terrestrial planets. The legacy of Apollo, what were the game changers? Really the cornerstone. Most of what we think about here and conceive of the thickness of the crust, the characteristics of the crust, et cetera, are mapped from Apollo understanding. Modulated, of course, on Mars for the presence of water and other types of things, but it really is fundamental. This enables the basic chronology for the Earth and history of the planets. We now have a geological record of one plate planets for what was going on in the early history. And this gives us an idea of even for Venus, you know, where it fits in this overall context. And that's all due to the framework uh, from Apollo. So I wanna just end here with a very, very fundamental thing and something very important for uh, EC and also University Bern. And uh, it's using the moon as a platform and a template. Of course, I mentioned the solar wind experiment. There were solar wind spectrometers that were deployed. There were dozens of instruments uh, on different missions that in fact were able to understand uh, using the moon as a platform, understand space weathering, a critically important aspect of the moon and the planets and the asteroids, et cetera. And of course, astronomy from the moon on Apollo 16, you can see here's John Young jumping off the moon at about a meter. Uh, George Carruthers, had an, a, a far UV camera. You can see it here in the background in the shadow of the limb here. And here it is here. 
And this was indeed the harbinger of things to come for astronomy uh, from the lunar surface, from the far side of the moon, etc. So indeed, the Apollo Lunar Exploration Program was a fundamental game changer, fundamental game changer. So here we are going forward to the moon and on to Mars together, forward to the moon in the Artemis program. And I hope to be able to come back in 50 years and tell you what even more game changers were able to do with Artemis. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very, very much indeed, Jim, for this uh, wonderful lecture. And we're looking forward to your talk in 50 years. <laughs> your <laughs> invitation is already out now. <laughs> Okay, there. I, I'm pretty sure there are you know, questions uh, out there, and there are basically two ways of asking your question. Um, you can either type it in in the chat, and then I will read it to Jim, and uh, so everybody can hear what the question is, or you can electronically raise your hand to, you know, on the bottom um, uh, of of the of the Zoom uh, software. There is this uh, raise your hand feature. Uh, and then uh, Willie will, um, you know, give the floor to you. Uh, so I see already three raised hands. But before I turn over to them, let me just um, uh, read you know, three of the questions in, in the chat uh, for you. So um, uh, Leon Enright from the Irish TV says that he was a witness in the science back room when the orange soil was found. Uh, and he reports that it was traumatic. But he's asking, do you think that uh, Armstrong's late undocumented sample set uh, in retrospect, I've heard it described as one of the most important of the Apollo missions. Any comment on this? Yeah, first of all, hello, Leo. Miss seeing you, hope to catch up with you soon. Um, I think, you, you know, the Apollo 11 samples were, were, they were documented, they were well documented. I'll just tell one quick story that uh, Bob Gilruth, the director of the Gilruth Center, they um uh he he looked at this the astronauts documenting the samples which they did very carefully and he actually worried that the rock box would come back with like six documented samples and he wouldn't have time to do anything more so he took neil armstrong aside neil told me this um he said uh neil uh when you get through collecting and documenting those samples take the shovel and fill that rock box up okay um because i don't want you to come back with that thing half empty and, you know, Neil, yeah, roger that. And so <laughs> the thing was so full that the indium seal, which was supposed to seal the rock box, uh, was, was not, not completely, you know, uh, uh, sealed. So the bottom line is, uh, Leo, that there were a bunch of undocumented samples in there, uh, but there were a bunch of documented samples too. And, you know, the, the, the cosmic ray exposure ages, looking at the orientation of these things that were documented, all of these things were critically important. Um, and the undocumented ones gave us a lot of samples to to send around and you know uh, send around to everybody on the earth i mean we had as you know uh, from 100 or so different countries people were looking at these samples so i think it was a it was a bimodal kind of thing both of them were really important okay stefan nicolescu asked um, you know um, that uh, apollo was conceived as a purely engineering program a cold war a power struggle with the soviets uh, without any plans for science is that true uh no, that's not true. Um, ba basically, the overall motivating theme, of course, was was political. I mean, we never would have gone to the moon in the Apollo program for science alone. Absolutely no question about that. You just cannot justify the cost. But once it was decided to go there, there were two factors. One of them is you never know when you're going to be able to actually land. You have to have precursor missions, et cetera. So a lot of rockets were built, a lot of lunar modules, et cetera. And early on, the National Academy of Sciences, international scientists, et cetera, made the case uh, to, the, to, to the federal government and to NASA that, in fact, science should be a fundamental part of this. And indeed, it was science was in there from the beginning, OK? These things didn't just happen overnight, these science and engineering things. The, the key to the success here was, in fact, that, um, that, that we were able to, once the engineers were able to accomplish an objective like landing safely, we were able to get them excited. Okay, how can you help make our scientific dreams a reality? And you know, you land once, what's the next challenge? Okay, these are really great engineers. And so they would say, oh yeah, wow, you need more stay time. I, you know, I think we could do that. Yeah, a car, hmm, a car, huh? 
Maybe we can fold it up and put it in the lunar module. <laughs> Think about that. That's an engineering challenge. So it was in there from the beginning. It evolved as a function of time. Uh, you know, uh, it, it sounds like a lawyer joke, but some of my best friends are engineers. I mean, really, it's just great to work with them, okay? So I, it was really important. Um, I think one other thing I would say is, um, you, you know, when I was in sixth grade, the teacher said, what's the best history? One that's written at the time of the events or one that's written 50 years later? And uh, I thought to myself that you, it, it ought to be the one that's written at the time because everybody's memory is fresh. And she said, no, you need time to get perspective. There's too much emotion in the early events. So here I am 50 years later looking at the history of Apollo. And a lot of people said, oh, they were scripted. As, there was only one real mission. And said, you know, I'm here to tell you that I think I was right in sixth grade. I appreciate her point. You know, you tell me if I'm biased, but, um, you know, <laughs> it was amazing. Science was in it from the beginning. Those goals and objectives were there. As we increase engineering capabilities, we uh, were able to accomplish these. So I think that's the history and the legacy. And you can look, look at the legacy of that, okay? I'd say one other quick thing here, which is, uh, you know, lots of times people will come up to me uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, conspiracy culture, so to speak, and, and around the world actually and say, uh, did, did, didn't, did, did America really go to the moon um, or was it all faked? Uh, and I said, you know, there's just one thing you need to know that NASA is perfectly capable of sending humans to the moon and returning them safely, but they're perfectly incapable of covering it up. Okay, so trust me on that. Okay, so the bottom line is we went to the moon. I'm here to tell you, and uh, in fact, NASA could never cover up something like that. Okay, Jim, we have so many more questions, but let, let me just switch over to the, to the raised hands for two uh, and then come back to the, to the chat questions. So Augustine, um, really, can you unmute Augustine? And uh, yeah, Augustine, can you pose your question? Uh, sorry, I, I pressed it by mistake. Uh, in any case, thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Greetings. Okay, uh, Roger Bonnet is next. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jim, for a fantastic talk, and it was uh, refreshing from people uh, of our ages to come back to this glorious time. <laughs> Several times during your expose, you mentioned the essential uh, uh, synergy between uh, astronauts, with, between the scientists uh, and uh, the, uh, the uh, engineers. Mm -hmm. I have launched uh, 15 missions in my life, and I must say that uh, this is absolutely true. <laughs> I concur with you, especially during uh, the, the time of crisis, if there is a crisis. One, one thing which I wanted to tell you, I think I read recently, it's, a, it's not very important, but recently I, I read that uh, the, first, the first object which the uh, uh, astronauts deposited on, on the moon was not uh, the, the American flag, neither uh, Johannes Geis uh, uh, instrument, but the garbage can. <laughs> Oh. The garbage can with all the excrements and what goes with them as garbage. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, well, yeah. So, so you know, you, I, I, I can't remember exactly when in the timeline that was, uh, but, um, but you know, you do have, you do have, uh, you, 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 let's put it this way. Um, it sounds terrible to put trash on the moon, but it was all bagged up. It's not a problem. But the bottom line is, what you really want to do is to take out mass. Um, that can then be replaced with rocks and samples coming back, okay? So I would, rather than saying they took out the trash uh, first, I would say they made way for all the scientific experiments and the samples coming back. Uh, I can't remember exactly in a timeline, but it's, it's quite likely that that would be one of the first things, uh, one of the first things to go out. Yeah, that's, that's true. I'll check on that, Roger. I'll, I'll check on that, this, Roger. I'll 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 check on that and get back I, I, to you. Associated with this is my, my uh, substantial question. As a scientist, who you are, how do you react, react to the ambition and plans of private companies to explore resources of the moon, developing villages or one village on the moon? 
how can we, and these will certainly uh, have an impact on the environment of the moon and therefore on the uh, science you know, that we can do. So how, what is your opinion and attitude with respect to these two objectives, building things for, on the moon and uh, extracting science from the moon? They seem to be incompatible. Yeah, I, I, Roger, it's a, it's a really good question and it's something we absolutely have to face uh, among those in, in addition, space law, et cetera, et cetera. These are kind of things that are being discussed right now and they need to be discussed even more and it needs to involve everyone, okay? I think. I think to me, I, I would say I, I've spent five field seasons in Antarctica, in Antarctica, and I think that the best example would be like the way the South Polar region is right now. That is the Antarctic Treaty, um, and we work out indeed uh, focusing primarily on scientific exploration, not so much on uh, resource exploitation. Um, you know, I think it works really well in Antarctica. Okay, so we should use that as a model, I think. And this, that sort of paradigm gives you the ability to work out the details. Okay. And, you know, the, the fact that we have water on the moon potentially, you know, uh, as a resource, uh, who's going to, how are we going to share that? What's going on? Um, you know, where, where does the Artemis Accords of the US, uh, you're welcoming everybody, but is China welcome? I hope so. Um, uh, you know, and, you know, the international politics is going to deal with it. So, you're right, Roger, there's a, there's, let's just say a requirement for um, larger scale types of uh, interactions. Maybe the United Nations can play a role here, uh, but we absolutely have to coordinate that so we do not, um, you know, essentially uh, make the moon uh, a mess, so to speak, like, like we're doing with Antarctica. In Antarctica, when we go there, it, it's, it's essentially, um, uh, it's essentially, we, we, we try to leave it as we find it. Um, leave footprints only and try not to leave those is basically our, one of our credos. Thank you, it's a beautiful answer. Thank you very much. I agree with you completely. Okay, let's, let's take another one from the chat. Andrew Ball asks, what Apollo science has it taken the new orbital missions uh, since the 1990s to unlock? Yeah, the, the, you know, basically, the, all the missions that have taken place, I call I call that in a you know another talk sometime. Uh, basically, the lunar renaissance. So you know, after Apollo seventeen, we we really uh, left the moon um, and had very few missions. Uh, and uh, the deal is that um, you know in in the late in the, in the mid to late nineties, of course, we began to um, to send ro more robotic missions. So Smart One. Uh, you know, uh, Lunar Prospector, et cetera. And then of course, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and, and other international missions. Uh, the Chinese have a beautiful lunar exploration program. It's just incredible, okay. Um, and India, uh, Russia uh, should be launching Luna 25 in early October. Um, and we're going back with Artemis. So there, there was that lull in there, but I call it a renaissance because if you look at all the missions that flew then, we really began to build on the Apollo fundamental framework. If if they'd been you know if they'd been missions without Apollo, we'd be looking at spectroscopy of the moon from orbit, but not really having the ground truth. But we know where the ground. We now know, <laughs> you know, we can look at a high resolution spectral resolution image and actually pretty much figure out what kind of rock types are there. That's great for geological and and petrogenetic and analyses, but it's also great for traverse planning. We know where to go, okay, to get the samples that we need uh, to fill in the gaps in Apollo. So that was an incredible time. It was a renaissance in lunar science, and I think it's helped set the framework for, in fact, the Artemis mission and all the uh, activity that's going on internationally now. Okay, uh, Bernard Fouin would, would, would be next, but he has also raised his hand, so uh, I think he can ask the question you know, when he, when he uh, gets the bird in, in just after you know, another question here. Um, okay. Yeah. But uh, yes. just Hello. Maybe the next one. Yeah. Huh? Oh, oh Bernard has already. Okay. 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 Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, yes uh, great uh, talks and uh, about history, the science. I have a, a question related to. Uh, forward uh, the moon, and um, uh, we have mentioned uh, the big legacy in terms of science of the moon and what we can un learn for the Earth and other planets. A bit on science from the moon with some uh, of this uh, early astronomy experiment, 
But uh, what about now uh, science on the moon? So life sciences, material sciences. So where they already thought our life, uh, I mean, you had to maintain the astronaut uh, alive. So the risk of uh, dust, but also the potential of a uh, future life science uh, activities in presence of radiation, in presence of the condition on the moon. So mm -hmm. how would you see uh, uh, what was done at the time since Apollo and what is the future for life science uh, on the moon? Yeah, uh, it's Bernard, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, and indeed, the things are going on. During Apollo, there was a lot of study of the effects of space on the astronauts, for sure. Okay, there were a lot of experiments that were done when they were on the way to the moon, in orbit around the moon and back. And indeed, they were, um, you know, a lot of biomedical experiments. They had, uh, you know, uh, kind of like, uh, I don't know, um, vests on, which had instrumentation, uh, so their body functions could be, uh, could be um, uh, monitored, et cetera. Uh, you know, lots of the, those data. That together with what's going on in the International Space Station, you know, provides us with a framework for understanding longer term evolution. And so we'll be able to use that. And and, it, and indeed, it directly, as you point out, leads into uh, the moon as a platform, but the moon is a platform for understanding human uh, behavior in one sixth gravity over longer periods of time, uh, human behavior and long duration space exposure. You know, do we absolutely need to go into caves on the moon uh, to uh, protect ourselves from, uh, you know, uh, cosmic ray, solar flux uh, variations and micrometeorites? Uh, these are the kind of things we we got to we got to study as we go along. So, you know, the Chinese have some radiation experiments that they're that they've deployed on Chang'e four and 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 other kinds of things to to anticipate these sort of things as well. Um, and it's going to be a, a really important part of um, of the upcoming mission, so that we actually know how to live there uh, for long periods of time. <clears throat> and I think Apollo helped to start the, the the groundwork, lay the groundwork for that. And the dust is a real problem. Uh, you know, we, we're going to have a seminar tomorrow on, uh, among many that are held on, on the lunar dust problem. Uh, you know, as, a pro as, you, as you know, Bernard, dust was what killed Lunacod 2 um, when, uh, when it got dust on a radiator and it overheated, um, and it, it was all over the spacesuit. So it is a clear and present both operational and health danger. Uh, we have some students at Brown and Rhode Island School of Design who have actually been funded by NASA uh, to look at ways uh, to uh, use new fabric to uh, repel dust from the joints of, uh, of spacesuits, et cetera. So even the students uh, are, are feverishly working uh, on this problem. Thank All right. Uh, there was a question by Marchand. Uh, what fraction of the Apollo mission took place in the magnetosphere as opposed to out in the solar wind? It, 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 uh, where compared to the solar? Uh, what fraction of the Apollo mission took place in the magnetosphere? Oh, in the magnetosphere. As to out in the solar wind. Uh, uh, well, I, I, it's a great question. I just, I don't know the answer to that. That's not, uh, that's not an area I'm familiar enough with to give an educated answer. I, I'm sorry about that, but uh, I can look it up. But by the way, if anybody is interested in. Um, uh, a PDF of, of these slides, uh, you know, I'm happy, just send me an email. Um, it's right there on the slide and I can, uh, I can send you a PDF if you're interested. Yeah, but the talk is also recorded and will be, okay, great. And will be on, on okay. uh, these That's great. Yeah. Hakan Svetan has raised his hand. So Hakan, um, uh, pose your question. Really just give word to Hakan. Hey Hakan. Hear me? Yep. Okay, fine. Thank you. Great to see you. And uh, thanks for a fantastic talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, it's just amazing to think about it. It's 50 years ago these old things have happened. And the achievements, uh, absolutely amazing. I'm sure you only touched upon a, a, a fraction of everything that was, uh, was achieved during these missions. So one of the things I was thinking about, you described the training and where, where the astronauts and you were sort of discussing all these things. They were not uh, trained geologists, but sort of learned a lot uh, with you there. It sounded very sort of informal. And at the same time, I know that there was a huge number of people behind the Apollo program, maybe 100,000 number of heard. So how was it that informal? And is that something one can imagine for in the future that will happen? Everything is so controlled nowadays. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. And, and uh, it's great to see you, Hagen, <laughs> even remotely here. Um, so it, it was not 
it was not informal, it was formal. Uh, there was an Apollo Lunar Field Geology Experiment team, uh, which was primarily focused with the, uh, the astronaut training to train them in the geological traverses and sampling and geological education. This is run out of the US Geological Survey and Flagstaff, Gene Shoemaker, Gordon Swan and Bill Mulberger with the PIs, and then Johnson Space Center and others like myself at NASA headquarters were directly involved in this. Uh, and that was integrated into the Traverse planning and, and mission operations and, and so on as well. It was, it was very well planned. It was not at all ad hoc. And that was one of the things I was talking to the flight operations director about, um, you know, last Monday was, okay, so where, how does that, how does the scientific community get better integrated into this? And, uh, and how do we develop that plan? That's, uh, where do we go? Uh, you know, one thing is that the Apollo, uh, that the south circumpolar region of, um, of, of the moon, where Artemis is scheduled to go, okay, to look for resources, et cetera, is way outside the Apollo Luna sample zone. This will be great. It's actually sitting on the rim of the South Pole Aiken Basin, but it's gonna be much more like Apollo 16, that is to say complex relationships. So, you know, we're thinking about how that training has to factor in too. It's not like you can say, oh, that's a lava flow over there. And that's a, you know, impact breccia and so on. It's gonna be really complex. So it's gonna require even more of um, you know, the, the kind of training uh, that will uh, really give you a, a, a leg up on trying to understand and sample correctly. Um, yeah. I, I would just add one other thing. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I've seen hundred, hundreds of space movies and they're all really awful in terms of what, it, what it's really like to be there. Um, uh, and you know, I saw Apollo 13, the movie. If anybody wants to know what it was like in mission control, that's the movie to go see. That's the closest I've ever seen to what it was like being there. <laughs> About a week after I saw that movie, I saw Jack Schmidt, the Apollo 17 geologist astronaut. I said, hey, Jack, did, have you seen Apollo 13 yet? Uh, that was really superb. And he said, yeah. He said, there was just one problem with it. I said, what was that? He said, all the actors in mission control were too old. And I thought, you know, you're right. He said, he said, don't you remember that the average age in mission, mission control was 28? So, you know, one of the things we need to do here is to <laughs> get engaged with um, youth and diversity because, hey, would you turn a big program with human exploration over to 20-somethings? Well, actually, Apollo was like that. So, yes, you should. So get young people involved. And I just wanted to add one thing to uh, I forgot to add this to the answer to, I think, Roger's question about, um, about commercial aspects. You know, SpaceX, uh, Blue Origins, the commercial lunar payload services are all really important developments. Um, and I think, you know, I work, I do some consulting work for SpaceX um, in, um, on, primarily on Mars, for human exploration of Mars. Where are we going to get resources? Where's the ice? Where, you know, what's going on? And, you know, I visited their their uh, factory in Hawthorne, California. And I have to tell you that the spirit there is as most like Apollo as anything I've ever seen. They are on a mission, they're dedicated, they're sensitive to things, okay, for sure, in terms of um, the kinds of things we talked about, about responsibilities, et cetera, but, but they're on a mission. And I think that's a really important component of future exploration. You know, if we can harness uh, these capabilities and imagination, um, you know, who knows where we can go? So. I'm all in favor of engaging these people, but I agree with Roger and, and uh, Bernard and others that, you know, we really need to be careful uh, about, uh, you know, uh, making the planet exploration of the moon like a little bit more like perhaps uh, the Antarctic uh, Treaty example. On the exploration of, of, of Mars, uh, what would be, what do you think is the most important thing you've learned from, uh, from the training with the astronauts? Uh, that you could apply to go to Mars? Or is it something that you missed during the Apollo training of astronauts that you would take up for the new generation going to Mars? Yeah, um, you know, I think, uh, you, you know, I, I like the quote of Mark Twain. I think he's purported to have said, um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, okay? <laughs> um, and I think that's, you know, I'm not here to tell uh, people that here's the way we did it, you got to do it that way. But I think it's important to, what are the rhymes? What are the themes? And it's, you know, like you said, what, what are some of these themes? It's not so much uh, what we can carry forward is the development, well, the strategy in Apollo was what, what I like to call T cubed, TTT, train them, trust them, 
and then turn them loose, okay? Situational awareness is such that when you're on the moon, you know best what's going on. You know, somebody who's down on the earth is subsidiary to you. So you train them the best you can, you trust your training, you trust them, and then you turn them loose. If they need help, they'll call you. And we did, that's exactly the way it worked on the moon. And we helped them out when they needed it. But they were well-trained, they did superb jobs. Uh, and I wouldn't wanna be uh, essentially looking over their shoulder on a minute to minute basis because it would completely interfere with things. Social networking is a danger to that, okay? Uh, you know, do you want the astronauts to hold a rock up and say, you know, hey, uh, should I bring this one home or, or do you want this one over here? You know, I mean, which, which of these should I pick up? No, no, you don't want to do that at all. You want to train them, trust them, and turn them loose. And I would say one thing is when we think about Mars, which is your question, um, we're not going to have that capability. There's a 15 minute at least time lag. And when there is that lag, man, if you haven't trained them, trust them, and turn them loose, uh, you know, they're not going to have the ability to do that. So one of the things we talked about with the Houston Flight Operations Directorate is making sure that when we do Artemis operations, we optimize the independence of the astronauts on the moon, because in fact, that's exactly the way it's gonna be on Mars. Have debriefings between the EVAs, uh, and there'll be multiple debriefings, but in fact, uh, don't look over their shoulder completely. Don't, uh, you know, don't, uh, overuse heads up displays and other kinds of things, which are going to be distracting for them to operate as humans do best uh, with their brain, with their intelligence and their independence. So that would be my, uh, my comment. Too, too long winded. I'm sorry, but it is what it is. There's a question by Francis Vestal in the chat. There has been questioning of the so-called cataclysmic peak of impacts. Can you please give an update on present understanding? Yeah, Francis. Thank you very much. I, yeah, good to hear from you, Francis. I so, so you know, I heard a talk from um, uh, a, a colleague in um, a talk at MIT uh, earlier in the week from a colleague in um, in at uh, at uh, Munster University, uh, Munster that you know where she was asking that question. She was presenting the questions: Is it a is it a peak or not? I think one of the key questions here will be sample return from Artemis because there is indeed uh, you're sitting on the rim of the South Pole Aiken Basin, which is the oldest known basin on the moon. So any samples we bring back, and maybe the Chinese will bring back samples before we do um, from these areas, um, you know, th th these, these will give us, I think, some answers to that. What is the South Pole Aiken? How old is it? Uh, does that help support, you know, if, it's a, if the age is, uh, is 4.2, then you got to cram all those other basins in there. And I think that'll have a tremendous bearing on what's going on. Uh, so I, I'm optimistic that we're going to solve that problem uh, with up, upcoming robotic and human exploration of the moon. Okay, Uli Köhler from the DLR uh, Institute in, in, in Berlin asks, um, how, how realistic or how close was Jack's proposal to land one of the canceled missions on the far side? Hi, Uli, how you doing? So, um, yeah, so we had a lot of discussions about that. We actually did a lot of planning with the engineers. And uh, uh, I, I, uh, the, the problem with the far side landing was that you needed a, a communication satellite. The Chinese did that. That's how they landed Chang'e 4 in the South Pole Aiken Basin. Okay, Magpie Bridge. They, hey, you need infrastructure. There's a concept, you need infrastructure. Okay, so they did it, uh, put a communications, landed on the far side, et cetera. You know, that was an added expense. Um, there was indeed, uh, I think I would say, uh, the added complexity, if something went wrong with a communication satellite, you'd leave the astronauts on the far side completely on their own, which at that point was not, not likely to be, uh, you know, <laughs> well, was just too dangerous. So it was discussed somewhere in the middle. Jack told me that somewhere in the middle, um, Chris Kraft, the director of Johnson Space Center, the legendary flight director, called him in his office and said, Jack, stop this crap because you're taking up times of my engineers and we're not going to do that. So I suspect that um, it was a good, we did talk about it. We did talk about it a lot. We talked about landing in, in earth light for crying out loud. Is there enough light uh, in earth shine uh, to actually have a landing? You know, when you go out on the with huge moon, moonlight, you can find your way around without too much trouble. So there were a lot of things that were considered, um, but I think that one was probably not on the agenda for Apollo 18 to 21, maybe afterwards, okay? 
certainly it's an option today. All the things that the Chinese did in terms of uh, Chang'e 5 mission, all the engineering capabilities and operational capabilities, that's exactly what you need for human exploration if they have an orbital uh, uh, infrastructure, the communications, they can land on the far side too. Okay, um, Gaillard, uh, Alberto Zahn revealed traces of water in some moon's basalts. There is a controversy on whether this is a local anomaly or representative of the bulk moon. What do you think? Well, we, we, that's a very good question. We've done some modeling of the generation S and an eruption of magma. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, a couple of papers, uh, the, the, there's, you know, send me an email, I'll send you more, more reprints than you want. Okay, but uh, the bottom line is, I think, you know, the question is, what is the water that's detected by remote sensing techniques? You have water in the rocks, okay, at the, particularly in the picritic glasses on Apollo 15 and 17 that Alberto and others and uh, Eric Harry and others uh, have measured and, and discussed. And we've done some calculations on those that suggest that, that it's an endemic part of the magma itself, not necessarily something that's basically enhanced uh, by shallow magmatic processes. You know, these pickrites are from very great depths, more than a couple hundred kilometers. And based on the modeling, they come up pretty fast. And so there's not a lot of time for them to stall and build up water content that would give you a false impression of how much uh, water is in the actual magma itself. So I'm pretty confident that uh, that those estimates for water content are pretty robust for for the primitive source regions uh, of the of of, uh, of the of the mantle. Okay. Um, do you think there will be a program such as Apollo for Mars? Why or why not? The question from Joanna Visa. Well, I I think. You know, I mean, uh, as we talked about, uh, one of the big motivations for Apollo was indeed Cold War rivalries. Um, I mentioned that we would never go uh, such a robust program to Mars um, uh, without without that motivation. I, I so how do we motivate humans to go to Mars? It's expensive. It's very expensive, of course. Um, uh, are you talking about a threat? Uh, it, you know, are we talking about international rivalries here? Uh, it's quite frankly hard for me to imagine that a uh, 21st century Cold War rivalry with China would generate that kind of motivation and interest. Um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time working with my Chinese colleagues, and you know, they're going. Um, you know, they <laughs> they they have a plan. You know, the, the Chinese culture. You know, it's it thinks the very long term, uh, very long term. So they're building a Silk Road to space. Don't even think that that's not going to happen. It's going to happen. Okay. You know, there's a lunar exploration program. If you look at the logo, those two things that are part of the symbol for the moon are footprints. It's going to end up with human exploration. The programs are starting to merge. Um, so there, that's going to happen. So whether that, uh, so I don't think there's a major international political uh, struggle that's going to be generating the kind of thing that went into the lunar program with Apollo. Um, maybe the answer is that we don't work at detente or separate, maybe work at entente. Maybe there's a way we can put together all our efforts to, um, to in fact provide the resources that are required to, for human exploration to the moon, to the Mars, to the surface of Mars. Uh, it's, it's, I think the United States will do it eventually, whether it's a long-term program or not, I'm not sure what the exact motivation will be. Uh, I think more likely SpaceX will probably send humans to Mars before a single nation does. Um, so lots of unknowns out there, uh, but indeed it's, it's, as you know, it's uh, very hard to predict the future and any one of those components, uh, the international one, the, the private industry one, uh, or some kind of rivalry uh, could generate that kind of um, program. So sorry, I don't have a more, I'd love to know the answer to that question, but, uh, but uh, I think we're gonna have to wait a couple of years. Yeah, as we all do. Jean-Louis Monet asked uh, or wonders, you know, about the evolution and improvements between missions. You know, what was uh, long planned and what was short, term plan between the missions that, that were so close after each other. Yeah, it, it, it basically 
the pace was set by uh, a variety of things. Um, you know, like I said, we would do um, debriefings when they came back. Uh, we would be picking landing sites for two or three missions ahead. Uh, they would be sort of a bake off, narrowing it down to two or three for two missions down, uh, narrowing it down, deciding on one for the next mission, and then factoring in the lessons of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, of the previous mission, the one that just happened, uh, into into that planning. So, for example, uh, I worked, I did a lot of work on Copernicus Central Peaks as a human uh, rated mission. That was a fundamental landing site, um, and it turned out that in fact. Um, the uh, uh, Apollo 12 samples, which suggested that they had a date for Copernicus, that was one of the major goals. So that kind of took Copernicus off the list and brought other things up to the front. Uh, Apollo 15 was originally scheduled to go to Marius Hills um, because we knew that some missions were being cut from the end of the Apollo program. We wanted to go to more combined major objectives. That's why going to the Apennine Mountains and the Mare and the Sinuous Rill and other things there um, were combined together. That that put that site up into uh, uh, more um, uh, a more favorable uh, conditions. So so uh, you know it. And then of course there were all these other engineering factors. How do we get the how do we get the uh, second or third EVA? Or do we have enough consumables? It's it's hard to, for me to look back on this and and realize that we actually did it all. But um, it was quite. You know, hard work. It was uh, diligence, I think, on the part of the engineers and the scientists. Um, and would I want to do it that way again? Um, if if it meant that that was all we were going to get, yes, the answer is yes. If it meant that we could do better by um, stretching it out, I would certainly want to do that as well. I think a good example is an illustration of the problem is, for example, uh, originally Artemis was scheduled to land on the moon in 2028. And of course, Vice President Pence at the time moved it up to 2024. Um, NASA is currently assessing whether that's realistic or not. I think the answer will surely be that that will be stretched out. And quite bluntly, I think that's the smartest thing to do for sure, uh, for the kinds of reasons you're thinking about. How can we do better with more time? Okay, Masaki Nishino wonders how harmful the neutron and charged dust particles on the lunar surface were for the Apollo astronauts and the landers, and how about lunar space weather forecast? Yeah, th there were a whole host of uh, charged particle experiments, um, uh, and, and you know, I, I'm not being a geologist. I mean, I was very familiar with, with, um, with uh, indeed the deployment and orientation and and uh, and of that, but I'm less familiar with with the results of that. I, I think you know a key issue associated. I think you're alluding a little bit to this. This whole question of uh, electrostatic um, adhesion of dust, and maybe even um, this whole question of whether uh, the moon has, um, you know, whether dust is electrostatically lofted. I'm not. Is that part of your question? I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I I, I I can't. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, you know, the astronauts when they were in orbit, and from the Surveyor Three spacecraft, there was this thing called horizon glow, where it looked like there was a glow on the horizon. And of course, there's a little, there doesn't seem to be enough atmosphere to support it being atmosphere, solely atmosphere. And, um, and so um, people thought, well, maybe it's dust lofted by electrostatic forces when the Terminator crosses the, uh, that portion of the moon. And a lot of effort went into these observations and also into, there was a a dust experiment on Apollo 17, where one looked at the accumulating dust. Um, I, I don't. I think the. I think that the jury is still out on whether that is effective or not. It's still the the uh, observations of the astronauts and the Surveyor three sp spacecraft. I don't think have successfully completely been explained, but I don't think the, there's a good solution to the general question either. The CLIPS program, the uh, Commercial Lunar Payload Services program, will likely have a lot of experiments on board, which will be individual experiments sent to the moon a couple of missions per year, which will try to address these kinds of issues. And I think maybe we'll have an opportunity to address that in the coming years, but I don't know the answer right now. I'm not sure anybody does. If you could choose a new landing site with the present knowledge or current knowledge, where on the moon would you go? Question by Anilak Baird. 
I, I would go to the um, interior of the South Pole Aiken Basin. I think dating the South Pole Aiken Basin, I think uh, understanding what the mantle material might be on the far side versus the near side, uh, looking for the same kind of evidence that we have for uh, the moon um, is, uh, you know, for the, for the near side of the moon is really critical. Um, so South Pole Aiken Basin would be, uh, would be my highest priority. Um, I would say that the second highest priority has just been accomplished by the Chinese, which is uh, going into the Propylarum Creek terrain and sampling Mari basalts, the young Mari basalts, to know their exact age, to calibrate the timeline, and also to understand when lunar volcanism waned and is it generated by magmatic, uh, essentially by uh, thorium rich substrates which help to melt the mantle in that region. So Chang'e 5 was dedicated to that area because of these questions. And so those samples are going to revolutionize our thinking about the moon uh, in the coming just couple of years, actually, because they're now in the receiving lab at, uh, in Beijing at NOAC, and they are going to be distributed. People are writing proposals at the present time. They're going to be distributed this summer. So stay tuned for some really important short-term things. And then let's figure out a way to get samples back from uh, the South Polar region to look at volatiles and the South Pole Aiken Basin uh, as well. Okay, uh, M. Ahmed asks, uh, you, you mentioned in 2011 that there was pyroclast with, uh, that contained water. What are the possible implications of this? Is this water trapped in the minerals or water in the subsurface? Well, it's, it's basically water rich source regions. And then as the magma ascends to the surface, um, you know, decreasing atmosphere, decreasing overburden lithostatic pressure decreases the pressure in the magma and the volatiles of any kind, carbon monoxide, others, carbon dioxide, sulfur, they come out of the magma and water is one of those. And clearly that's when the water came out of the magma. And when you get to the surface on the moon, you have one sixth gravity and almost zero atmosphere. So the gases expand radically. And so if you think about a pyroclastic eruption on the earth, like a fire fountain in Hawaii, it's very vertical, okay, uh, because of the atmospheric pressure. Um, but at, on the moon, they're like on EO, the innermost of the Galilean satellites, where it's an umbrella, expands into the vacuum. And so you basically, they're tiny little fragments that are cooling as they come out. And those are what contain the residual water um, in, that, uh, that they measured in the, in the picric glasses, Alberta, Saul, Harry, and others. Um, so yeah, it's primary from the mantle. It's coming out as a function of uh, eruption. Okay, Rudy that, that, that produces the dark that produces the dark mantling deposits, say at Apollo 17, etc. Rudy von Steiger, my colleague at ISSI, asks: um, There are nations that have not signed the Antarctic Treaty and do not adhere to it. Wouldn't you expect the same to happen uh, on the Moon and Mars by protecting the Moon and Mars, basically? Well, I think it's an ongoing uh, process, and I, I I don't have a particular timeline. It, it, it's, uh, you know, I think the Artemis Accords are an attempt at that, um, where international, you know, there's kind of a broad agreement that will coordinate. There's like a six or seven parts of the accords. You know, we respect each other. We will coordinate all our activities. We'll let you know here, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and, and I think, you know, a lot of countries have bought into that. Um, it, uh, unfortunately, I think in the Trump administration, it was a little politicized. So I think it it was a little bit, uh, you know, there were there were unfortunate comments like, well, you know, that nobody. This isn't actually one of the accords. I think I don't think, but it's like you know, share our democratic principles or something like that. I mean, like you know, I, I, okay, but let's not try to exclude people artificially here. Okay, so um, so there are these Artemis Accord-like things going forward. Um, you know, there's the east, like the, the, uh, the, the lunar village and, and, you know, how you, how you coordinate and operate that. Um, I think it's going to be a, a difficult time. I don't, I, I, let me say, let me say it's going to be a hopeful time. We know what's going on. We have some examples. We have the moon treaty for crying out loud, which is already in force. Um, and, uh, and so we just need to figure out a way to, uh, to um, basically encapsulate that even more 
and uh, and work out the details. Work out the details. I, I'm confident we'll be able to do that. I don't I don't see the moon as being, you know, uh, used for military purposes. I don't see it. Uh, there's competition. There's going to be economic competition if we really discover some resources like lots of water in one crater and there's only one crater and all the water's there. You know, we're human beings for crying out loud. So there are going to be those things, but you know, um, we can we can resolve those. We can resolve those, I think. So I'm hopeful for the future. What do you expect to be the scientific game changes in the Artemis program? I think there's going to be a lot. This is why I'd love to come back in 50 years, maybe make it 25 years. Um, but um, I think, first of all, um, we're going to have lots more mobility, lots more capability. You know, these landers are, are built to stay. We also have cargo capability. You know, the, the Blue Origins and other landers, um, and the, particularly SpaceX, I mean, they can carry huge amounts of cargoes to the surface, cargo to the surface. So, you know, you can go with humans in one spacecraft and then uh, go with a rover and another spacecraft um, and, uh, and uh, basically, you know, uh, build up uh, resources there for uh, longer term stays. Um, and I think then the scientific exploration that will go with those. My, my hope is that we take advantage of all these capabilities to utilize and full access of the moon. I would be excited on the one hand, if we were able to set up a long-term station uh, in the South Circumpolar region to explore it, I would be disappointed on the other hand, if that meant we never left the South Polar region, uh, because in fact, there's so many other areas to explore on the moon. And I think that uh, we will all be thinking about ways to send sorties away from any kind of base like we do in Antarctica. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't spend, we, we only spend a few days in McMurdo, the base. You know, we get our equipment, our tents, our uh, food for a couple of months, and we get helicoptered out and dumped in the dry valleys for a couple of months. So, you know, we want sorties, we want camps, we want other things where we can explore the full access uh, to the moon. And so I'm, I'm optimistic that Artemis itself landing on the rim of the South Pole Aiken Basin is going to be, again, a game changer. But we need to make sure that the seeds are planted for sorties uh, and full access uh, to explore the moon. The other thing I'd say is don't forget the lesson I mentioned initially, which is human and robotic partnerships are really crucial. So, you know, we need to develop spacecraft that are not just precursors like the 21 spacecraft that went before Neil set foot on the moon were, but that are. Uh, essentially interpolators and um, extrapolators that go fill in the blanks between them, that go uh, extend it further, and then in fact can go back and mop up. You know, what questions do we have now we weren't able to address? Let's send a clip mission there uh, to, uh, to follow up on, on that too. So human and robotic partnerships are going to be a new, new dimension here as well. Okay, uh, Clément Feller asks, uh, you know, could you give us an explanation how during the Apollo missions, superficial and average porosity of the regolith came to be confused and thus for the fairy castle characterizations to be joked on by Dave Scott, for instance? <laughs> That's a question for the deeply involved. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I would give Dave Scott's comments. I don't remember exactly what you're talking about, but let's say he made joke of the fairy castle structure. Um, I think, you know, there was a, there was a backdrop here of uh, uh, Tommy Gold, the, the physicist from astronomer, physicist from um, Cornell, uh, really was adamant, a very articulate guy. Uh, he was adamant that the, that the, that the lunar Maria were made of dust, dust migrating, for, and that basically the astronauts were going to collapse in. That's really different than the fairy castle structure. But I think people maybe confuse a little, not you, but I mean, you know, maybe astronauts that are, they, they have that residue in their mind uh, that we spent huge amounts of money to prove that uh, the astronauts weren't going to sink in. And, you know, that may have been their simple minded way of, of talking about a fairy castle structure. No question, things like the fairy castle structure. That's why we had that camera, the goal camera, literally. Tommy Gold's experiment to look at that on Apollo 11 and, and, and so on. And, um, and, and we still don't fully understand it. I mean, from my perspective as a geologist, it's not just the evolution of the regolith, it's also 
space weathering. I mean, you know, where's the nanophase iron? Where is it? What what goes on with that structure? How do we look at the happy key, happy key parameters to look at the photometry as a function of that? What happens in, in that? So that, that surface layer is still critically important. And the, the fairy castle, you know, the role of electrostatic in, in that, these are all really still fundamental questions. And I think, I don't remember the comment by Dave Scott, but I would I would judge it might be going back to um, uh, the 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 idea that that in fact the astronauts would sink in a quick a quick war story here. After Apollo 15 came back, um, we had a big conference in Houston uh, at at the big Building One Auditorium, and I got Dave Scott to be a one of the um, essentially uh, chairs of the session, and you know. He, this is the commander of Apollo 15. Okay, so um, Tommy Gold gets up to give a talk about how the Maria are formed of lunar dust. And he shows a picture of the edge of Hadley Rail with rocks. And he said, look, these are rocks that have rolled down from the surface. And, uh, and you know, the dust is surrounding them, etc. And so that proves my theory. And everybody in that auditorium except Tommy Gold realized that he's standing next to the guy who was at the rill and picked up the basalt bedrock that is not coming down that form from lava flows. And everybody's going, oh my God, what's he going to say? And Dave just said, well, that's, thank you very much, Professor Gold. That's a very interesting theory. I guess I'll just have to go back and take another look. So <laughs> yeah, you had to have been there, but uh, anyway, uh, I, that's okay. a, that's a, I'm not sure it answers your question, but I hope it does. Okay, how many day, days do you think the astronauts should stay minimum on the surface? Uh, the Artemis crew is actually bent. You mean uh, for how Artemis? How many days should they stay on the surface? The Artemis crew? Well, I, I, I think that's just open to um, you know. I, I think for the moon, you know, it's uh, it's it's not as uh, uh, necessarily as. Um, demanding an environment as it might be uh, in some other situations. So, you know, it's, it's plenty non-terrestrial, uh, so, so to speak, but uh, I think it's, it's gonna be a question of consumables. I think, you know, it's gonna be taking it days at a time, weeks at a time and building up that confidence of, uh, of essentially consumables, uh, oxygen and water and other types of things. It might depend on how many resources you can extract from uh, the surface in terms of water versus um, what you have to bring with you, for example. Um, I, I see no reason why people can't eventually be there, you know, semi-permanently, uh, if not permanently. Uh, it's just a question of time. So many questions, but we seem to be coming to the end. Here's one by John Rummel. Jim, do you think that the volatiles from the Apollo propulsion system will be detectable in the permanently shaded regions on, of the lunar poles? That's a really good question, John. I think the so you know gases when they get emitted on the moon, you know, of, are volatiles, and they'll go they'll go to coal traps eventually. So I would say that's the first thing we should look for. Um, you know, we have a bunch of workshops that you're well aware of, and with this lunar surface science virtual workshops, where one one considering what's the contamination from not only these giant landers but the ones that went there before. And I, I think that, that, that yes, that it, that's the first thing we should look for is evidence for that. And that, that'll be good science too, to realize you know, whether it gets transported there, how much, and then how long it stays. Um, so so that, that's, that's gonna be really interesting. It is a good question. Uh, and I think we have to worry about contamination as well. I think most people think of the polar ice deposits as being resources, but of course, we really should be thinking about them as geological records because they really record, as John was pointing out, hey, volatiles from the Apollo program and uh, you know all the other international landers on the moon, um, you know maybe they're that upper layer. If so, we can learn a lot from that. But don't disrupt the lower layers because that's the history of accretion of volatiles in the solar system. How much comes from outer space? How much comes from degassing from the interior of the moon, uh, and and so on and and you know, I, but let, let's just be crudely blunt about this. Before we use water extracted from the moon to flush toilets in a lunar city, let's make sure we learn everything we can uh, from a, a, the scientific analysis. It's an incredible record of volatiles in the solar system. Okay, I think we're coming. We're exhausting the uh, the, the the comments or the questions in the in the uh, in the chat. 
Um, so thank you very much again, Jim. This broke a record in uh, uh, the time you know we we spent uh, together with you on on this for the, in the Game Changer seminar. Uh, very much so. We're almost two hours uh, on, uh, on now. So thank you very much for the time you uh, devoted and, uh, to this. And um, it's been it's very much appreciated. And I didn't read all the compliments and thank yous uh, that are in the chat. You can uh, look at the record afterwards and, uh, and look at it, at it for yourself. Uh, thank you very much for staying so long to the audience. Um, next week, we will have a talk on the Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer, so an astrophysics uh, talk, Timing the Extreme Universe uh, uh, by Tommaso Belloni from ENOUGH. Uh, and uh, this then will be followed in the week thereafter by an Earth observation talk on wind and waves at the ocean's surface, insights from this CFO set uh, mission with uh, Daniela Hauser. The game changers will then come and end uh, by the end of March and take a break for the month of April. And then we plan to be back in May with a more themes oriented uh, uh, game changers follow on uh, seminar with uh, talks about the origin of the solar system, comparison to other solar systems, um, uh, uh, black holes uh, and and uh, about um, you know problems in the terrestrial environment. So uh, take a look at our website where you will see the program and uh, stay tuned. And we appreciate very much uh, your visiting our website. Thank you very much again. And have thank, a good thank you all for thank, thanks for the invitation, gentlemen.